Okay. Hi there. Welcome. Um, I am Dr. Jill Weiner. I am a meditation and uh, tapping practitioner. I work mostly with physicians on physician wellness and um, also am a striving anti-racist, which is an everyday process and I'm learning more and more. I'm doing a series of interviews for my um, YouTube channel, and I'm so grateful to have here today Dr. Susan Rogers with me, who is one of my colleagues from my old days at Rush in Chicago. That's where I had my medical career. Susan's amazing. She lives in Chicago. She's always had incredible things to say um, about everything, but particularly about race, and I'm just so pleased to have you here with me. So Susan, thank you so much uh, for being here, and can you... Can you tell my um, audience a little bit about yourself and um, who you are and, and where you've been in your life? Sure, Jill. Well, thanks so much for asking me to do this. Um, this you know, incredible. I'm highly flattered, but I'm glad to do this and um, share my thoughts on some things. Um, I grew up in Chicago in an area called Hyde Park, which was one of the rare integrated um, neighborhoods in Chicago it was right next to the University of Chicago campus but um, I grew up and that was when everybody went to neighborhood schools um, and I grew up with whites and blacks and Asians I mean it never occurred to me that the world was different than this um, even though you know, my parents would say things. My father was from Macon, Georgia, so clearly really. his upbringing was very different yeah. than what I was growing up in. My mother was mixed. Her father was Jewish, and I can't imagine what her parents' relationship was like. She was born in the late 20s, so back then interracial couples were, you know, not common at all. Yeah. And so there was a lot of, you know, discussions and, you know, things that went on. And then as I got older, um, there was a lot of uh, issues with uh, uh, segregated education in Chicago. And my mother would bring us on protests and that. And I got involved in boycotting. That was, I grew up thinking that was a good thing to do. Um, we went in March with Dr. King on one of his visits to Chicago against segregated communities in Chicago and the need to integrate um, those communities and education. So I grew up always thinking that this was an issue. And also that was when the Black Panthers were, um, they, 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 what's the right word? They became an entity. They were, you know, developed, they were encouraged, and they weren't that much older than I was at the time, some of them. In fact, when I was in medical school, one of the other black students was an ex-Black Panther, and um, so we had great discussions there. But um, where did you go to medical school? I went to the University of Illinois, and I graduated in 1979. So this was back when black students were just getting admitted to medical schools, there was affirmative action, and there was a lot of, you know, microaggressions and macroaggressions there, you know, that I didn't need to be there, I hadn't earned the right to be there, and da da da. And that was even in undergrad um, when I went away to school. I went to Colorado College, which is in Colorado Springs. I never heard of it before, but uh, a friend that I had grown up with, white guy, that we were supposed to have been married. We got engaged when we were in third grade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very long last day. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out. But um, uh, he was, uh, he ended up going to a private school after eighth grade and he graduated a year ahead of, ahead of me from high school. And he talked about this school where you took one class at a time, you took nine classes for the year. and I said, wow, this sounds great. Plus, if I don't go now, I'll never get out to Colorado. I mean, back then the world was small mm -hmm. and you didn't think you'd go places. So I went there and having grown up in Hyde Park, it was a rude awakening because I never realized that there were white people who had never seen a black person. And at the time, although my hair is still kind of like it, I had the big Angela Davis fro and the wire rim glasses. I was an Angela Davis wannabe. Yes. And, um, 
And so I left after two years. It was a wonderful school, but it was the black students there, we were all very close because all we had was each other. Nobody had any money, nobody <laughs> had cars to go anywhere. And um, it was just not welcoming even though the school was an excellent school. So I left there, I went to an HBCU in Virginia, um, and I was actually a little disappointed because it was more about fraternities and sororities than about the black movement at the time, which was, you know, red, black, and green and all that. And so, after that, my junior year, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, whether I was going to go back. But unfortunately, my mother got sick. So I decided to stay home. And I ended up going to Roosevelt University in downtown Chicago and got my degree, since they would accept enough credits so that I could still graduate in four years. And, um, and so I decided then to go to medical school. And interestingly, I mean, my whole goal at that time was to train at Cook County Hospital it never occurred to me to go anywhere else. And so that's how I ended up at Cook County. And um, I felt that that was my role. That's why I became a, a physician to take care of black people. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the way I saw that I could do it best. And of course I was on the faculty at Rush and that's how, how we met. Mm -hmm. And um, because I never did any clinical care at Rush Hospital. But so I've always been involved. I've always felt this um, reason to, to do something more. And uh, that's why I went into internal medicine. I didn't want to subspecialize. I did for a minute, but I'm glad I stayed where I went. And so and I'm still in Chicago and still, um, you know, involved with Stroger Hospital. I retire, but I'm a volunteer physician there because I still feel this desire and want to take care of the people there. What are you doing volunteering there? I don't think I knew that you were. I was in the, uh, I actually stopped that at the end of December. I was precepting in the residence clinic and then I was going to go back, but then of COVID and they said I was too high risk because of my age. <laughs> and so I'm not there now. And okay. then I've been involved with the Physicians for National Health Program, which is uh, national organization with over 20,000 physicians um, that our mission is to promote and hopefully achieve Medicare for all, which would help address some of the health inequities that we see in this country mm -hmm. that I saw every day. So let's, let's talk about that. I mean, I did a series of interviews on, on COVID um, and, and health disparities in our country a couple months ago. Um, when all the data started coming out, but I mean, you've lived it, you know, most of these doctors that I, I, I was talking to are, are, are around my age, if not younger. What was it like then? I mean, in, in Atlanta, Grady, Grady's where I went to, um, where I did most of my training. And you, there used to be like a black Grady and a white Grady. Um, mm -hmm. And it was very segregated. Um, and now it's a county hospital that's predominantly black. What was it like? What, what were some of the barriers that you saw during your training and, and as has, has that improved what, or has it gotten worse? How have you seen the, the health inequities over time? Well, it was clearly, we saw patients who had nowhere else to go, but to the <laughs> county hospital. Yeah. And we saw everybody, no matter what their insurance status was, what they were able to pay. I don't even think there was a billing department when I was there. So even if you came with insurance, I don't think we ever billed them. Wow. Um, we got support from the county and from the federal government so that, you know, we, uh, we were often overwhelmed by volume but we, we did have a lot of resources there. And the interesting thing, especially in internal medicine, I was working with a group of doctors who weren't just there because they thought the training was good. They were there because they wanted to take care of the patients that went to county. So the atmosphere was very collegial. It was very, uh, a lot of, uh, social justice issues that everyone was involved in, that everyone supported. So it was really 
a camaraderie. Now, I can't say the rest for all the departments at the hospital, but mm -hmm. at least in internal medicine, pediatrics, um, ob a lot of the uh, primary care uh, programs, we were there because we wanted to be there. Those were the patients we wanted to take care of. Uh, and uh, people said, why don't you go into private practice? I didn't want to go into private. I wanted to take care of the people there. And I think that it was also important for them to see a black physician. Um, I was, you know, I'm trying to think of how many others were, there may have been, um, there were others in my program with me, but we were clearly the minority as we still are mm -hmm. back then. But it was a very rewarding, and I still remember patients that I took care of there. And even as I, you know, over the years, there's still patients I remember, that, and they still remember me. Did you do outpatient or inpatient or both? I did after I finished my training. I was in primary care there yeah. and um, I worked in uh, the Woodlawn Clinic, which was in Woodlawn on the south side of Chicago. Okay. And I did that for about 15 years. And there were a lot of patients that I just, I just love primary care. I eventually became a hospitalist when I got involved with medical student teaching because I was teaching on an inpatient rotation and it was natural. But when I worked as a primary care physician, it was a, a very rewarding experience because I looked at it as I wasn't just doing medicine. I was taking care of people that I cared about. I gave, you know, older patients bus fare, I mean, cab fare, because in the wintertime, you know, four right. o'clock, it was dark. And, you know, you're 80 years old. You don't need to be standing on the bus stop, you know, and I would give them, you know, uh, we would talk about things. I knew who died, who got born, who got married, who got divorced. You know, they brought pictures. Mm -hmm. And I have to share a story about a patient I used to take care of who was a Tuskegee Airman, but the same age of, as my father was. And he just reminded me of my father. And then when I left there, um, he would still call me every Christmas holiday. And he was getting old and it used to, it's making me sad talk about this because I knew one holiday he wasn't gonna call. Yeah. And it turns out he passed. Oh. And I mean, he was one of the last few Tuskegee Airmen, you know, but you know, he was just an incredible man and it was a privilege to take care of him. And those were the relationships I had with patients there and it was, it was more than just being a doctor. It was um, a labor of love. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's something about, there's something about training and working in a county hospital that's just like the best. I, I, that's where I fell in love with internal medicine was, was during my time doing that. And I actually wanted to work at Cook County and they didn't hire me. So that's why I ended up at Rush. They sent my resume to Rush, but um but yeah, that's amazing. So did you encounter, like, all right, I'm just trying to figure out where to go here. Did, did you encounter, because I, I worked, I volunteered at the HIV clinic at County for my last few years um, at Rush. And I mostly encountered great people, but I have an, an, an experience that stuck out in my mind. Um, during 2014, when the Black Lives Matter movement started and one of the attendings there white attending white male uh in the hiv clinic who's like obviously working in an hiv clinic at a county hospital i mean his heart should and maybe mm -hmm. is in the right place but i remember him saying oh yeah but he's a thug you know like eric garner got you know uh yeah but i heard he's a thug and like i remember hearing that and not quite knowing in my ignorance and my privilege not quite knowing knowing that i didn't like that answer but not I still like had that mindset of mm -hmm. that that's acceptable to say, oh, that, that that might actually be an acceptable excuse, which obviously it's not. But did you experience that? I mean, you said you were one of very few black doctors. Did you have that experience at County of, of like a fraternalistic view from patients? And did you yourself experience? Um, yeah, I experienced um, racism as a medical student, yeah. um, you know, and I'll never forget, a, uh, I was doing ob rotation, and it was my first clinical rotation mm -hmm. as a medical student, and this 
we had a conference and we were sitting in a room with the residents and the other students on the rotation and the white attending asked me, he described a woman who, you know, was older, who had menopausal symptoms and said, so Susan, what would you do? And I said, well, we could give her estrogen and see if she got better. Cause back then all postmenopausal women got estrogen. And his response to me was, well, that's what's wrong with black doctors. You just give medicine when you don't know what's going on. And I, I did not know what to say. I did not know what to say. Plus at the time then too, it's a little different now, but as a student, you looked at attending physicians like your parents. Mm -hmm. You may totally disagree with them, but you didn't say it. You know, you were still respected authority and all of this. And the resident apologized later for him and said, I'm really sorry that happened to you. And he was wrong, you know. But those, those situations were still coming up. They were still coming up, you know. Um, uh, some of the evaluations I got, you know, I don't think were fair. And so I think part of the problem stems from not knowing the history of this country at all. We have written, not we, but the country has rewritten history mm -hmm. with bleach. <laughs> I don't know how, it has taken away all the parts of it that it didn't like and changed it into things that made it look clean and bright. And so, and we have this culture of victim blaming, you know, if, if something bad happens to you, well, you obviously did something wrong. You're a thug, you know? This wouldn't have happened if you had been nice and followed the rules, you know? So, you know, and even now we say, you know, well, part of their problem with people who are unhealthy now is they don't eat well, you know, they don't have good habits. We victim blame them. And we don't look at why there are some populations where the effects are more, um, are worse than in others. And we like to blame the victims, you know, but it's clearly the structural racism of how this all started right up. I mean, it started with, you know, in 1492, I suppose, but even slaves were brought before that. But this, uh, you know, after slavery and uh, there was then reconstruction, which sort of, you know, sort of said, okay, everything's fine. We had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, the 13th, which abolished slavery, the 14th, which said everybody who was born here as a citizen, and the 15th Amendment gave black men to vote, the right to vote. Back then, even white women couldn't vote, so only black men were able to vote. And so everything was fine, but that only lasted for, you know, not even 10 years reconstruction because what the South found out was that the majority of the population was black because the majority of the population there were ex-slaves who were still living there and they had the right to vote. So this was a problem. <laughs> and so, and many of them were farmers. They stole their land because black farmers had no recourse in the courts. They had no legal support. They, you know, the land was just taken from them. And so then the migration started. And so that was how the South got rid of the black vote. They made it so, and with the KKK and Jim Crow laws, and I mean, there were a whole lot of facts, it was not safe to live there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they, they solved that problem. And they are no longer, the minority there. They made sure that as the minority, they were the only ones who could vote. And um, all the, a lot of governmental policies that came after that have created this segregated country. And one of the problems about how, what segregation creates is the ability to legitimize falsehoods. Mm -hmm and that you can create myths and distort the truth and you have no way of knowing any different. You're not taught history that reflects a difference and you don't see anything different. You know, the news portrays black people as thugs. You know, if you, even if you look at basic things like mugshots, you know, the photo of Dylan Roof, he didn't look like a bad guy, but every black person's mugshot 
Mm -hmm. You can, oh yeah, he's, you know, they take the worst picture possible. Right. Uh, to show on TV. And so it's just this, this whole creation of black people as there's something wrong with them, which started in slavery and, um, and it continues. I mean, it still continues. And, you know, you can't say, well, we have Oprah Winfrey and President Obama, and, you know, yeah, those are great success stories, but, you know, that doesn't take away from the segregation and the racial, the structural racist society that we have here. Yeah. I find it amazing how the links that people will go to, particularly white people, to make themselves feel better about things that are obviously horrible, but like, and part of it is fed to us mm -hmm. without even knowing that there would be something else to, to look for to eat. You know, like part of it's just like, that's what you learn in school. So that's what you learn in school. And then by the time you're an adult, it's like ingrained, but, um, but the, the notion that slavery actually ended, you know, and the, and that, that black, that all of a sudden like that, there was a whole other horribly violent legal slavery, you know, like, like non-slavery slavery, um, that, that, um, I learned about just recently. And it's like, how, how is it possible? And I love what you said about segregation helps us legitimize falsehoods because you don't have any other way to know. Um, I mean, if we look at what happened in the early 1900s, uh -huh. reconstruction ended and um, there was, and black people started being incarcerated. I mean, and that was how mm -hmm. they, reestablish slave labor, labor mm -hmm. you know, was that if you incarcerate these, because they didn't have a job, so there were all these vagrancy laws and that's how they arrested them. And many of them died before they ever got out of jail. And so they continued with free slave labor, you know, with, with all of this and uh, the Jim Crow laws. And then the migration started up north which created a whole nother set of problems. But if, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the Tulsa riots now that mm -hmm. Trump is going to Tulsa to give his rally. But there were multiple, I mean, I think there were like 20 or 30 cities populated by black people. They did the right thing. They did what other white people were doing. They established businesses, they took care of their families, they had neighborhoods, they supported each other but they were looked at as a threat, so they were destroyed. Even in Chicago, up north, in New York, in Boston, they had these rights, they just destroyed black communities. Mm -hmm. And so this whole idea that we can't do things, that we're not productive, that I, we don't wanna work, and I've, I've heard that for so long. You know, I work hard, they should work hard. They have worked hard and things got destroyed. And so what gets created is situations where black people don't have choices anymore. And the struggle is for survival. And even if you look at how segregation has created poverty in these neighborhoods, Chicago is a very segregated city. If you look at the total city numbers, you know, it's almost 30, 30, 30, 30 black, 30 white, 30 Hispanic. You know, um, but there's very few neighborhoods that are integrated. Um, my husband who Easy. grew up, yeah, on the South side, his parents bought, both his parents were teachers and they had bought a, a home that was being developed and they got a mortgage from uh, a black real estate company because you couldn't get government mortgages then because of redlining. Um, uh, the federal government, can you talk about a little bit what redlining what, is? For yeah, what redlining is, is that when uh, the Federal uh, Housing Administration, and that was what was created with uh, the New Deal, FDR's New Deal. And what it said is that the government would back mortgages so that if you defaulted on the mortgage, then the government would pay that thing. And so you still had to qualify for the mortgage. So what had happened is that they devalued they said that if a home is in a neighborhood 
there is at least one black person, we won't give a mortgage to that community because the housing will not be any good. They just decided that the housing wasn't going to be any good. It wasn't going to be of value because black people live there. So even if you start, and we, you can see neighborhoods now where the housing is similar, you know, the same square footage, the same number, but, but a house in a black community is worth much, much less than the same house in a white community. And that's what created segregated housing. So then what happens is that because you have homes that are worth less, and that was the way people accrued wealth, black people didn't accrue any wealth because their homes, and then because they weren't get, be able to get these mortgages uh, through the FHA, they got what we call predatory mortgages or contract mortgages, where it was almost like you were a renter and an owner. You were a renter in the sense that you didn't accrue any equity in the home. You paid every month but you had no equity in the home until that last payment was made. Whereas now, if you pay for 10 years on a 30 mortgage, 30 year mortgage, you sell your house, you still have value in that house, which you get back when you right. sell, whereas they didn't get that. Wow. But they were treated like owners in the sense that they had to fix everything that broke. And pay taxes. They, and, the, and the taxes were uh, inordinately high in black neighborhoods. They were assessed inappropriately. So it was a predatory situation that was doomed to, it was not meant to support those neighborhoods. It was meant to destroy them and create poverty because people lost their homes. People ended up working two and three jobs because if you need a new roof, you know, you have to fix it. Otherwise your home, you know, so it created these segregated communities that did not get the resources from the city in the terms of sanitation and other amenities, parks, education, mm -hmm. all of this. None of that was there. So of course these, these neighborhoods were not as good. I mean, they were made to not be as good. It wasn't that the people there were not as good. Right. It was created to not be as good. And so, uh, they became poverty stricken areas. And this is why, you know, and even now when you see uh, poverty and people don't, I don't think get white poverty is not the same as black poverty. If you look at where white people, white poor people live, the majority, they're spread out. They're all over. But black poor people seem to live in one area. And if you look at what we call concentrated poverty, which is where 40% of that neighborhood lives below the poverty line, 25% of poor black people in this country live in areas of concentrated poverty. Yeah. So these are areas that don't have schools that are any good. They don't have grocery stores. They don't have drug stores. They don't have transportation. They don't have businesses. All these other things that support a community, these neighborhoods don't have so people are are living their lives struggling day to day they make choices based on survival whereas i was fortunate to make a choice to go to medical school which is how many years ahead i'm looking forward way beyond tomorrow so if you're worried about food and housing you can't make a plan for four years because you have these struggles from day to day. And that was what was created. And if you look at the percentage of white people who live in concentrated poverty, it's only about 5% of poor white people wow. live in concentrated. So poor white people still have access to decent schools. They still have access to grocery stores. They still have access to live in neighborhoods that support that community and have the benefits of transportation and jobs. Mm -hmm. So. You know, when a poor white person says, well, I worked hard, it's still not the same. They have a lot more choice. And it's not changed. Look at who the um, essential workers are today. Right. You know, I mean, if, you're, if your choices are, you know, fast food or not eat because fast food is cheaper, that's what you're going to end up eating. If your choice is, should I go to work 
and risk getting COVID and bringing it home to my family? Or should I stay home and risk being hungry and homeless? Those aren't good choices. So this whole idea that people make bad choices, some people don't even have good choices on their list. And I think that people don't understand that and they don't see that. And that these neighborhoods were created to, to not work. And I, I read something and it's the perfect statement and it describes this. It says, the system isn't broken. It's working the exactly. It functions the way it was made to function. And so we need to change the system. Healthcare is one of the aspects that we need to address because if you're not healthy, you, you just can't do anything. But how do you expect children who go to school hungry, who children who grow up in violence, who children who um, are surrounded by people who use drugs, who are threatened by the police, how are they supposed to function in school? You know, whereas in another community, their issues are, you know, what kind of iPhone do I get? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's two different worlds. Yeah. And unfortunately, the I've often thought that what you need to do to survive in an area of concentrated poverty will not really help you in an area that isn't like that. And that's why it's difficult for people. I couldn't function there. I, I don't I don't have the street skills for that. And so, you know, this whole idea that with integration, people want everybody to be like them, you know? Like, you know, it's not like, that's not what integration means, that everybody is a Karen, you know? Right, right, right. Like, like <laughs> the, the white ideal is what you should. And I, I some like, of the reading I've been doing, it's like integration wasn't, it wasn't what we, we now think that it was. It happened so that we could allow the, the black people to, to be around more white people to like raise them up towards whiteness, which is yeah. uh -huh. crazy. But then what was integration? I mean, one, one black family on the block, that's an integrated block. That's an integrated neighborhood. Right. You know, right. we students in the high school, you know? And then that takes away from then, then everything becomes white, yeah. you know, like, like the notion of having separate spaces for, for different communities, n not excluding others, but, but that that's a good thing, but that it should be, um, this is Ibram uh, Kendi um, talks about this in, in um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, the need for black spaces and the need for separate spaces for different minorities, because otherwise everything gets whitewashed and every, yeah. if you're 13% or 20%, if everything is done according to percentages of the population, then the white people are always going to be in charge and they're always going to. But it also reinforces the whole concept that what is black is inferior. Yeah. That rather right. than build up those neighborhoods or provide them with the same services that you have. Right. You know, that wasn't on, that wasn't the list of options. Right. The list was, well, whoever can get out, you know, can come here. But even now, I mean, I don't think, now my husband is a physician. We make good money. We, you know, whatever. But I don't think that a wealthy white suburb would tolerate 25 families just like mine who were black, mm -hmm. who, you know, can afford the same house. We want the same thing for our children. We can do da 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 da. I, you know, it's, that's still not acceptable. Yeah. Because there's something inherently about me that they don't want. And so that's where, what we have to fix. And this whole sense that, you know, there's something innately wrong with a black man bird watching. Right. You know, I mean, and I just saw a video, uh, on Facebook yesterday about this woman was videoing it and there was a group of five boy teenagers um, and they were younger teenagers, not like older, and they were cutting through this uh, park to get to some store. And it was a shortcut that apparently everybody took, you know? Well, the police stopped them and, you know, pulled out their guns. 
you know? And this woman stopped by in her car and, you know, I said, they shouldn't be cutting through here. Yes. So, you know, it's the same behavior is not looked at in the same way. And until we can get to that point, I don't know if we can or not. And I don't know if we necessarily have to, but we just have to look at just behavior by one group does not inherently mean a threat. And just because it's not white doesn't mean it's wrong. Exactly. That's the like part that's really been sinking in for me the last while is like this realization that if it's not done and then, and then thinking about how bad white people are doing it. Our country is in shambles, you know? Our country is not something to look to as an idea. I mean, for certain things, yes, or maybe for white people, yes. But, like, there are things about our country that are great, but it's so broken. Well, I'm if you look at, like, you know, people, they, you know, they tout FDR's New Deal. You know, like, this saved the country. This was, you know, it brought us out of the depression, da, 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 da. But I think what people don't, and I've read articles and they don't mention this all the time, but if you look at FDR's New Deal and he came up with Social Security, who was not able to get Social Security? Farmers, who were mostly black, and domestics, who were mostly black women. They were just disenfranchised. From the, he also created the aid to dependent children. And that was to help white women who were mothers who were not working. So it helped them support their child. It didn't help black women. But when it expanded to help black women, it's called an entitlement. Mm. So all these, and that's where this entitlement comes from. And you know, this whole thing about, you know, I'm not advantaged, I'm not entitled, but that's all you know, that's your normal. Yeah. And that's what's presented as normal for this country. Social security, help people. The GI Bill didn't help black GIs at all. They had all these training programs, but they were all segregated. They had these bills for college. The colleges were segregated, wouldn't let them in. They had, you know, all the, the mortgages. They weren't able to access those either from the VA or for the government, you know. And so they go to war, they come back, they get none of these benefits. And then we wonder why. Yeah. You know, so all these white GIs who do not see themselves as entitled were entitled. They were the ones that got the GI Bill. They're the ones. That's why they're the CEOs now. That's why they were able to help their children because they could accumulate wealth. Yeah. You know? And so these disparities and these, I don't even want to call them disparities. They're inequities because they're unequal and they are done on purpose. Yeah. Disparities are things that just happen to happen. You know, why is it more there and less there? But these are things that were created and they were made to do that. And I think that people who, white people who, were beneficiaries of that just see themselves as having worked hard and that's they were successful they did work hard there's no question but they were given the opportunity to work hard black GIs were not yeah. black black people were not given the opportunity to work and then when they did the towns were burned down right the people were killed yeah or you get shot you know, call, the police called you on your yeah. watching or, yeah. you know, like you can do it right. And, and from yeah. what I've heard, a lot of exactly. people say yeah. like, you work twice as hard yeah. to be thought of as equal and you're still not. Yeah. Like you work twice, twice as hard, hard. You have all the yeah. degrees. I saw that when I was in yeah. school. I see it. I saw it. It's there. And what happens that, and I struggled with finally believing that I was a smart. And I came from an environment where that shouldn't have been because I was never told by my parents that I couldn't do something, that I wasn't smart enough. I was never told that. The country told me that. Yeah. And so even though, you know, 
I, it took me a long time to, to fix that in myself. And so, and I don't know, you know, I would say that most black people never get to that point. They never do because there's too much around them that tells them no, that tells them that they aren't. That tell, you know, so we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And I, I'm thinking that I'm hoping that this is a tipping point mm -hmm. that people will see, you know, have some introspection about them, themselves and the people who have an opportunity to change things. And some people will never change. I mean, there's some people who are just, you know, they are who they are, um, uh, but they don't have to be the majority. And there have to be some protections and some governmental policies that support that. Because right now there have not been. Even when you look at um, the PPP for COVID, Black, small black businesses, they weren't even allowed to apply because most black, small black businesses in black communities are sole proprietors. They're the only ones and they were ineligible. They, Many of them, I'm a sole proprietor, so I was able to, so I think maybe you? the second round they like, you know, okay. maybe in, but, but I heard that like banks were using different criteria to determine if black, small And there's a lot of neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods that don't even have a bank. Yeah. They have a payday loan and they have a currency exchange. So they don't, you know, and if you have two or three employees or, you know, you don't have a relationship with Chase or right. Bank of America, Bank of America. And also those loans were small and it was, again, made so that bigger loans, banks wanted bigger loans because they get a bigger fee, you know. So by not including by by making the criteria such as that you're defaultly by default disenfranchising the people who yeah. need it the most and it perpetuates the whole cycle i mean it's nothing's changed here it's not changing yeah do you see signs of hope i mean for me my 14 year old niece posted about white privilege on her instagram which I think is awesome. You know, it made me happy. I was not talking about white privilege when I was 14 years old. I started talking about white privilege when I was like 38 years old. So, <laughs> so do, I mean, maybe, is there hope? What needs to be done? I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I know what lots of people are, white people are like, what can I do? But what do you, do you see signs of hope? Do you see what, what needs to change for, for things to start to get better? I think people need to learn the history so yeah. that they will feel confident in saying Black Lives Matter. Because there's, I think that in a lot of white people, yes, they know Black Lives Matter. But you have to understand why we have to even say that. Yeah. And if you don't understand why we have to say that, it's not enough to just say it because you can be turned the other way by mm -hmm. someone else, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we have to teach this. My daughter sent me a friend of hers whose daughter was in fifth grade, sent her a copy of a page in her textbook that said, Africans immigrated to this country for jobs. Like a current textbook said that? Yes. Wow. I mean, the fact that those things are being touted and repeated as a historical fact, we have a long way to go. I mean, I couldn't even make that up. If, yeah. if, if somebody said, what's the most ridiculous you can think of, you can think of, of why Africans got here, I still couldn't have thought of anything that ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know? What do you, do you have a history source that you think is a good one that, that people can read? I'm, I'm listening right now to uh, Stamp from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi, uh, Ibram X Kendi, which is going through like it's a history of ra all the racist policies. Mm -hmm. You know, Tana wrote an article in The Atlantic 
I think it was about in 2014, 2015, called the Case for, Re Case for Reparations. Who wrote that? Tana Hesey Coates. Oh, okay. Uh, an excellent review. And I can't remember if he's got a bibliography or not, but I mean, it goes through a lot of these things. And the Atlantic Monthly actually had, it's called the Atlantic now, but it used to be the Atlantic Monthly. Uh -huh. But they've got, if you search there, they've got a lot of good articles on like what happened to black farmers. Mm -hmm. You know, why there are none anymore, you know, school education. They've got all of these things there that will go through the um, uh, the the historical facts of why we are where we are. And it isn't because black people are inferior, you know. And even if you look at the, you know, we're in the medical profession. We're no better. I mean, we have some, you know, lab tests like GFR. Why is there one for black people and one for white people, you know? Am I really more muscular? I mean, you know, so we perpetuate it. And yeah, you know, so much in medicine. It's yeah. so patriarchal and paternalistic. I, it, it kills me to think about it. And there's a, a guy, uh, Dr. Sims, I'm blanking on his first name. I want to say it's James, who they call the father of uh, ob who back in the early 1800s did all these surgeries and tests on slave women without anesthesia. And, you know, he is looked at as the father of ob -Ghani. And there was actually a statue of him in Central Park that was not torn down until 2018. Wow. There's chairs, endowed chairs, in many medical schools and academic institutions with his name. They are still there. So we don't know, you know? We just, because you have to make a point of finding out the truth. Yeah. It takes time and it takes energy. And if we don't do that, we'll never know and we'll never be able to change. So that's what I, you know, I actually have a lecture <laughs> that I gave to the medical students. Um, who are affiliated with Physicians for National Health Program, and it's on the PNHP website. But I went through this history of why there are health inequities. And I talked about these things. And I did it before COVID, so there's no data on COVID. I did it in February, early February uh, before we knew that, but it went through. So I'm not surprised, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, the inequities we see with COVID. It, the thing with health inequities and the problems that happen to our communities, they happen in slow motion. So everybody doesn't really see it or pay attention to it. A pandemic makes it obvious. It's like Katrina. Yeah. But again, they blame the poor black people for their problems in Katrina. Yeah. You know, and even the public housing that was in New Orleans that black residents fled from and went to the arena, they were not able to go back to those projects, even though they weren't damaged. They were sold to developers to make money. So those poor black people were sent scattered among the country. I mean, there's no respect. There's just, they're not treated as real people. Yeah. I and think that's the, the core of it. It's like not seen as, um, I saw ta Coates play and he was just saying like, we're bodies, like we are people with thoughts and bodies and emotions and that is not seen and valued and respected. And it just really, really struck me as so upsettingly true that there's just, it's not, it's not the same if you're not white or it's right. not the same if you are black, I guess, because I think other minorities aren't treated as badly, but I know That's been told since slavery times. Yeah. You know, there was a guy who did studies on lung function. And what he showed was that slaves had, when they were doing, they were just starting to do vital capacity because TB was so rampant in urban areas because of lack of sanitation and all that. And so what they found was that black patients had lower vital capacities. And they used that difference. Um, 
to say that, well, they need to work hard because their lungs need to work more to get brain to blood to their brain because they can't function in a situation of freedom because their brains won't get enough blood. I mean, forget the fact that they were functioning well before they came here or they well before they were brought here, but, but that justified treating them the way they did because physiologically, whatever, you know, they needed that and they justified it as that. And, yeah. and the vital capacity, look at a set of PFTs, it's still on there. It's a different equation for black people and white people. Oh, there still is. Wow. See, well, a lot of this stuff we don't even think about, but it, it I think, unconsciously reinforces. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And medical students are, you know, they're taught that there's genetically different things, you know, and I've got into arguments, you know, like you're aware of that medication Bedil, you know, I said, you know, what do you mean it works better in black people? What is it about, you know, mm -hmm. we do all, we give black people medicines all the time that the studies were only done on white people, you right. know? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. Oh my gosh. Well, Susan, we're out of our, out of time for today. I am so all day. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, no, I want, I don't, I don't want to end it. I, I wish I could keep going. Um, um, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and your perspective and your energy, uh, with, with me today. And for people who are watching this, uh, it's been so amazing to, to learn so much from you today and, and hear your perspective. And, um, you know, every time I do interviews, uh, I learn so much. Um, and I, I have so many more things that I want to go read about. And I think that for me, the takeaway message from this is if you look deep enough behind anything, there's racist policy there. And there's, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the job as white people is to not take anything at face value and not to listen to what we're told or, or fed, um, or taught, but, but to really look and, and understand yeah. when that's the way to, to true change. All right. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Well, um, I totally enjoyed this. Enjoy. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you. Okay.